This week at the agenda, we pulled back the curtains on the corridors of power, examined the future role of faith in the modern world, and pondered pension pluses and pension perils. The agenda's week in review begins with a look at policymaking in a data heavy world. Are there instances for which data mining gets us better information for policymaking as opposed to worse information for policymaking? Uh Mm, it, it, data mining, sh well, it's what Philip said. I mean, data mining is a technique. Data mining can give us information and then we have to make decisions based on it. It depends on what your question is. If you're looking for, as we talked about earlier in the program, marginalized communities, don't, probably don't go to data mining. That might be difficult. You might need reported data from a, from a survey or from a census. But if you want to do certain techniques where the data is available, so for example, learn just blunt classic demographic data, you could probably go to a mobile phone carrier and get information on what's popular on a Friday night to learn to, if you need to build new roads or not, or the sort of commutes that people have on weekdays based on the mobile phone data, rather than having to use other, other techniques that are more cumbersome to do. So it depends on what your question is, and then it depends on the wisdom of the people in terms of how they put that information to use. David Eves, would you weigh in on that? Yeah, I think there's two things about this that I think immediately strike me is there's definitely huge opportunities around data mining for public policy, and I think it has two implications. The first is um, I get much, very nervous. I think the real lesson of the long-form census is that politicians actually understand data, and they're actually quite keen to destroy data that might run counter to theses they have or policies they want to implement. So data is now very, very political, and politicians are savvy to this, and I understand that if they can control what data gets created, um, they could then potentially control future debates. So we need to start talking about that. The second thing that I would say is I'm very nervous. Um, you know, the, the wonderful examples of Walmart and all these places where we're using big data, um, I'm very nervous about a growing gap between the capacity of government versus the capacity of the private sector. I mean, for a growing number of people, they go to Amazon and they get these amazing recommendations, and it's like magic to them. And they do not have an experience that's anything remotely like that when they're dealing with the public service at the moment. The, the level, the ability of the public service to offer that kind of degree of service to them just does not exist. And if that gap continues to grow and grow, I, I fear about the confidence people are going to have in government. And, and that's why we need to be having these conversations today so we can start ramping this stuff up and, and start thinking about how it's going to impact programs tomorrow. David, I mean, David is exactly right. And uh, there's nothing other than good planning and money that is preventing uh, government from when you go and renew your driver's license, them popping up and saying, oh, by the way, your six-year-old kid, um, they're due for their immunization or their uh, birth certificate needs to be renewed or whatever the situation is, mm -hmm. much like Amazon. But we don't do that. Um, and should we do that? Of, uh, of course we should. 100%. We have to uh, connect all of uh, these uh, sources of data that the public sector have. Protecting privacy. Privacy to me is uh, to some extent a red herring. Of course, it's a concern, but it's a concern we can deal with. It's like saying, well, we shouldn't build roads because there might be traffic accidents. No, we can, we can deal with those and uh, manage those, and we put in speed limits and we do things. Privacy is a real concern, but we can manage it. We have all of these data sets, and there's no reason you, when you go online to renew your birth certificate or whatever it is, um, that you shouldn't have an experience like your online banking, where you've got all kinds of different accounts there and you can move your money around easily. Except um, that or some people are suspicious about the government knowing too much about them. That's but there. The, but That's the government there. already does know that about they them. They know it, it's but just... you don't want to be reminded of it all the time that they know all this about you. Well, I, so, I mean, David David keeps saying we need to have a conversation about it, uh, and we are, but I think the far bigger concern is that uh, year after year, you will have experiences when you go to Walmart and they suggest, why don't you buy this uh, product? You need it. And you go, yeah, I do, or Amazon, or your bank, where you seamlessly move money back and forth between your checking account and your savings we account. We hold and governments then, to different standards, and, and different you, and higher and, standards. And, and I, I think, though, that um, if we continue to do that, I share David's concern. The people will say, why do I have to go so many times and does it take so long? And why can't government be efficient and nimble? I've got 30 seconds left. Matthew's example is about service delivery, which we should be focusing in on. And people can opt into that. You can opt in to get your immunization records or your child's immunization record checked when you're going for your driver's license. But going back to data for policy making, we do have to be able to combine across all sorts of different things with census type of data to make informed policy decisions. I wonder when you guys had your conversations and figured out, okay, we're going forward with this, 
And then Mike Harris walks in, having just talked to the barber in the, you know, in the basement of the legislature, and says, oh, I got a new idea. Yes. You know, the barber said we ought to do this. How much did that drive you guys crazy? Um, I would go down and talk to Frank <laughs> and advise him not to give us any more advice. Uh, and we all know Frank the Barber at Queens Park, those of us that have worked there. He's a great guy, and uh, it was usually pretty good advice, but uh, sometimes it was the uh, timing of his advice that wasn't helpful. Gotcha. So uh, Steve, we, we Steve, promised the Premier that we would follow up on the advice and get back to him. <laughs> Hugh Siegel? Well, it, de it, it depended, if I may say so, on the idea. Sometimes I would do the famous <laughs> oh, Premier, that's very interesting, or Prime Minister, leave it with me. Um, and, yes. and the other time, however, I remember uh, our Prime Minister, uh, not unlike uh, Premier McGuinty, Premier Day, was very focused on uh, spending time with family, and he would regularly go to his kids' hockey games at an arena in the north end of uh, Ottawa, in the northwest end of Ottawa, and he'd be there in the afternoons. Uh, he'd he'd p play hooky from whatever was going on to watch his kid play hockey, and um, did this on a consistent basis. And uh, one of the games, uh, a, a bunch of the hockey mothers who were there gathered around him and said that one or two of them were having a difficulty with stalking from uh, ex-husbands and that the stalking laws they'd been told by their lawyers were not very strong, and he uh, re-emerged in the office at about five o'clock before a late cabinet committee meeting and said to me, please get the attorney general in. I think we should be doing something to protect women from exes who are stalking them. And that produced legislation in about four weeks time. So you had to be very careful, uh, but you also had to respect the fact that somebody with the kind of political judgment that a premier or a first minister or a prime minister has, something strikes them as worth further consideration. Most of the time, they're likely right. Uh, let me just confirm, Senator Segan, you're talking about Brian Mulroney there, is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. I was okay. talking about Prime Minister Mulroney. That's right. Okay. Let's go to point number two on sure. the uh, Ezrin list now of the five Fs, and that's facilitator. What does that job entail? Well, a lot of times you'd have people who wanted to meet with Premier, uh, and uh, they wanted to uh, be able to advance a particular agenda one way or the other. You had to make sure that they felt, I stress the word felt, that they had access but on the other hand, you wanted to make sure that the uh, operations of government were such that the, the, the Premier was able, and Premier Peterson in this case, was able to be able to, to fend what, what were the issues that were really there, what issues should be raised with this group in response. It wasn't that you were just a one-way group, but you were facilitating a kind of discussion. You had to make sure there were everything from briefing notes to very specific um, answers to why you hadn't done something before that you may have even promised, whether it be in an election campaign or at some other point. And so you had a, a lot of those activities. And the other part of facilitation all dealt with ministers because ministers also had their agendas and they wanted to come in and they wanted to argue the case of why they should be able to do something and you had to both help them feel that they were being facilitated in terms of being given their opportunity but at the other hand making sure that the premier's wishes were being uh, obeyed. Peter I'd love it obviously if all of you would spill your guts today and give us some great previously unknown stories about how this thing actually went down, but um, can you give us a sense of how you would both facilitate and yet protect, as your story I think implies, Herschel, uh, Premier McGinty? Well, yeah, I, th I, I think one, it, it actually it's the, the, the best example actually is before actually I was his chief of staff and I was chief of staff to the Minister of Finance at the time, who was Greg Zubera, who I was his chief of staff for about two years. One will recall that there was a day in Greg's life uh, where his lawyer called to say that the RCMP were up, up at, uh, at Royal Plastics and had served a subpoena and that they were looking for a series of documents in regards to some criminal activity by that company. Uh, which he was on the board of. Which he was on the board of. In his private life. In his private life before and he had, t he had, he had come off of it uh, when he had become the minister. Uh, there, there came a point where the lawyers had been all through everything, the RCMP had been all through everything, and uh, it just, the lawyers were saying, look it, this is, you know, it's, it's a valid, uh, it's, it, it's a valid subpoena, and you're under investigation. And so I was the one that sort of had to call and to the Premier's office and sort of say, I think this is the moment where Greg's got to step down. 
Uh, and I was the one that had to walk down. I, I think the most difficult day I ever had in my life was to go and see Greg, who knew, but someone had to go in and say to him, Greg, you have to step down, and you have to step down now. Uh, and uh, that, I mean, Greg and I had known each other for 20 years, and that was, that was not a great day for me. But I think that's how you, f you protect, facilitate the government and, and at that point for the premier, even though I wasn't working for the premier. But interesting, though, that the premier doesn't deliver that. The premier appoints him, but the premier didn't deliver the message that you've got to step down now. No, he didn't. Well, sometimes so we, sometimes they, they do, but in this yeah. case, we knew that we yeah. had to do it. You know, but there, there are other cases. I remember a case where I was dealing with a, a minister of mines who unfortunately had not um, understood that he couldn't invest in mining stock <laughs> while he was doing it. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and we, we had this discussion, and, and I was the, the, the first, uh, if you knew Mr. Fontaine, you knew he was, he was a good man, but he was very emotional. And um, so I was the first wave of troops on the beach <laughs> to try to explain to him why this doesn't work. And he, I remember him turning to me and he said, but I lost money on all of these stocks. <laughs> and I said, that's not going to cut it. You know? <laughs> In his years at the Ontario Teachers' Pension Plan, Jim Leach has been involved in several high-profile deals, such as the sale of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, and managed Canada's largest single-profession pension plan through some of the most volatile market periods in our history. He's announced he's retiring at the end of this year, but before he leaves, he's getting the word out about how pension plans need to change to keep up with these volatile economic times. Here's Jim Leach, President and CEO of the Ontario Teachers' Pension Plan, at least until December 31st, 2013. <laughs> nice to have you here in the studio. Thank you, Steve. What's the secret to getting double-digit returns annually? Uh, a whole bunch of smart people who know what they're doing. Um, and it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, this plan, the investment side of this plan, has evolved over 20 years. I mean, 20 years ago, we weren't doing the same things we're doing today. Mm -hmm. uh, that's partly because some of the financial instruments and markets are much more sophisticated than they were 20 years ago. But also, we wouldn't have been prepared uh, to take on the risks 20 years ago that we're prepared to take on now because we have the experience. Having said that, you guys are probably not nutty bananas about getting into things like uh, subprime mortgages and all of that, are you? No, we were not anywhere near uh, that market, but you know, for many people, buying a hockey team in the National Hockey League is a pretty risky uh, event. Actually, Mr. Leach, if I can tell you, buying the Leafs is about the safest bet you can make if you're going to buy a hockey <laughs> well, team. Wouldn't you agree? It certainly has uh, proven, <laughs> it proved its worth for the teachers of Ontario. Did you, what, did you, you make six-fold on that one? Yeah, approximately. Something yes. like that. Yeah. Okay. Having said that, it's not all uh, great news. You're five billion short right now, aren't you? That's correct. Uh, at our preliminary valuation at the end of the year showed a small deficit. Now $5 billion isn't a small number, but in the context of our $130 billion plan, it's very, very manageable. Uh, there are a number of uh, headwinds that we still are fighting constantly. Uh, the first being the economic conditions, low returns. You know, when uh, Canadian real rate bonds issued by the government of Canada are trading at 0.4%, uh, it makes it tough to try to earn uh, the returns. Um, and then secondly, the demographic tsunami that's uh, changing all pension plans uh, around the world and in, in f causing us all to come to grips with you know, what changes, what evolution do we need in order to absorb this great change that's happening in the demographics. Can I add another layer to that? And you tell me if I'm off base here, but uh, clearly people are living longer. Yep. And therefore, you're having to pay out pensions for longer than you would have had two Correct. several generations ago. And even beyond that, most folks, I guess, when they have a career, want to work about 35 years in that career. And I gather the average that a teacher works is 26 years. So yes. you are potentially paying out pensions earlier than others have to as well? That's correct. Is that our, part of the complication? Our uh, average retirement age is 59. Um, you know, and that compares to the private sector, which is more like 65 plus. Um, most public service uh, workers retire sort of 62, 63. So yes, retire early, um, working for about 26 years, and they'll retire and be on pension for about 31. Um, and then uh, when they die, their spouse will, will pay for about another four years. The gift that keeps on giving. It is. Well, the teachers Shouldn't... keep on living. <laughs> 
We are often told that we are not saving enough for retirement or living in fear that what we've saved isn't secure. But our next guest says our financial future is a lot brighter than we've been led to believe. Joining us for more from the nation's capital, here's Ian Lee, professor of strategic management and international business at Carleton University's Sprott School of Business. And Professor Lee, it's good to have you back on our airwaves here. How are you tonight? I am fine, Stephen. It's my uh, reciprocal uh, pleasure. Thanks for saying so. Uh, we've been told on this program and, of course, uh, others as well, that we are in deep, deep trouble as it relates to our pension futures in this country right now. Is that your sense of it as well? Um, not exactly. I mean, part of that is true. In fact, in this article we, uh, that we, where we analyzed the pension systems in Canada, we really broke out the, uh, the employer uh, pension plans, which does not cover all Canadians, it covers about 40% of Canadians, versus the overall pension system, which is really three levels. And, and, that's, uh, and so some people are saying, the critics are saying, we're not saving enough. We are really addressing the, the, the larger pension system, which has three components. The first level is uh, old age pension and guaranteed income supplement. Second level is Canada pension plan. And then the third are the employer as well as private savings such as RSPs. So what we were arguing is there are problems in the employer or the third level. There are problems there uh, because of uh, many of these divine benefit pension plans being underwater. But when we step back and look at the totality of assets and liabilities of Canadians in, in aggregate, we do not have a pension savings crisis, is what we argued using Statistics Canada uh, empirical data. That's what you've argued. How many people agree with that assessment? Uh, we're probably amongst uh, uh, the pension uh, experts in Canada, we're probably uh, a minority. I should point out that my co-author, uh, Chancellor Professor uh, Vijay Jog, is a, a full professor in the Sprott School. Uh, he's a professor of finance and his expertise uh, for the past 30 years on which he's published extensively is on pensions and pension plan systems. He was one of the uh, five authors of one of the five papers presented to the premiers at the, uh, at the uh, conference that was held, I believe it was in December 2011, where uh, Finance Minister Flaherty and the, uh, and the provincial pre uh, uh, finance ministers got together to discuss this very issue. So he is, as I said, an authority on pensions, and I came at it from the other side, which is the looking at uh, the Statistics Canada household balance sheet that uh, deconstructs all the assets and the liabilities that Canadians own and owe. And so we put the two together, you know, the balance sheet of individual Canadians against the, uh, the pension system to determine if there really was a gap. And we uh, determined empirically, based on public statistics from StatsCan, that there is not a pension savings crisis. And I guess we should say the fact that you're in the minority doesn't make you wrong on this. You've got some bona fides, yes? Uh, well, we've certainly got, I think we've got StatsCan data on our side too. Here are some numbers about, if I can put it this way, who's up and who's down in religion. Admittedly, this is only in Canada. If you look at Christian Orthodox, their numbers are up almost 15%. If you look at Catholics, it's basically status quo, off half a point. Anglicans, however, off almost 20%. And United Church members, off almost 30%. And that's uh, from 2011, looking back over the previous decade. How do you interpret those numbers? Well, I think all of religion is under suspicion now uh, for a number of reasons. It has disgraced itself in many ways. Secular knowledge, which was despised or condemned for a long time by Christians of all faiths has established itself quite uh, convincingly in the areas where it is sound. The church fought science, fought Galileo, fought uh, Freud, fought all those, fought, fought Darwin, uh, and of course those are winning. The question is, are we going to be only a scientific and a secular culture? Is there a spiritual, uh, supernatural reality manifested sometimes in poetry, sometimes in philosophy, sometimes in theology, and sometimes in religion, which can oppose this scientific culture without excluding it or 
denying its validity. I think there is because I see people do it. I try to do it. Uh, so in that sense, all religions are in the same fight, which is my point. Well, let me jump Why in here for a we? second, because th your, your friend, the theologian George Weigel, would say that's not quite accurate. He'd say that the religions that require more from you are doing better, and the religions that are more liberal and quote-unquote require less from you are fading. Has he got a point? Well, no. He has a very selective group that he uh, cites in that. There is uh, a retardative Catholic culture, and there is a non-enlightenment culture that's being ap appealed to outside Europe. Uh, but to say that you can win by saying the enlightenment is totally wrong and we were always totally right seems to me a very bad bet. Why do you think people are still spiritual when they clearly, in large numbers, seem to be rejecting orth uh, organized religion? I, I, there, there's something theotropic, if you will, about hmm. the human condition. We're, we're built for an apprehension of transcendence. Hardwired, do you think? Hardwired. What Peter Berger, my friend, the great sociologist of religion, used to call rumors of angels are something we all hear. Now, in the early 21st century, people are sometimes reluctant to connect those rumors of angels to the God of the Bible, to the God of Jews and Christians, or to any other uh, deity. Um, but the instinct is there. The instinct for the transcendent is there. Is that enough for you? No, it, it can't be enough. It has to be the invitation that's built in, hardwired into the human condition that people of faith have to then uh, take advantage of, if you will, mm. in order to say to someone, I know there's an itch there. Let me show you how to satisfy it. But well, we always There's ask a, about harm. What's the harm in just being spiritual as opposed to going to church every Sunday, taking on sacraments, etc.? Finally, the harm, Steve, is that it doesn't take you out of the great loneliness of modernity. Uh, modernity and post-modernity tend to be very lonely places. Not for everybody. I, well, for a lot of people. I walked up uh, uh, University Avenue today in Toronto from City Hall to the Provincial Parliament. Uh, fully half of the people I'm walking past are living in their own little pod world with ear things in their ears. Uh, there's no human connection there. There's well, a very on. real Probably loneliness. Probably half of them had earbuds in, but the other half were probably texting some friend. Well, that's, that's true, but half of the world being uh, alone is not a happy, happy scene. I, this has been a constant theme of philosophers, sociologists, psychologists for 250 years. There's some, there is a breakdown of human community uh, throughout the Western world in all of its various forms. Uh, the phenomenon described by Robert Putnam in that famous article, mm -hmm. Bowling, Bowling Alone. Alone. Yep. And that is part of what the church can offer people, and I mean the church in its broadest uh, sense. And that is The Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website, theagenda.tvo.org, on our iTunes channel, or on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.